Nini! Hello, and welcome to the Kemetic How-To Guide for Egyptian Pagan and Kemetic Practitioners. I'm your host, Sharon. It's the month of November, and the perfect time to explore some devotional books about the goddess Sekhmet. Now, why in November, you ask? Because, historically, the Egyptian month of Koyak was associated with Sekhmet, not just with Osiris and the Osiris Mysteries. And the month of Koyak starts in October on our calendar and runs through November. And then in late November you have the month of Tibet, which starts, and that's when Sekhmet has another feast day. So tis the season! So let's explore some modern devotional literature for Sekhmet. Our first book is Seven for Sekhmet, a pocket book of prayer by Galena Kraskova. And apparently this book was a, uh, an update of a previous book called Sekhmet When the Lion Roars. So if you have that, this is basically an update of it. And it is definitely a pocket-sized book, which I like. Uh, it's easy to travel, to stash away if you need. And on page three, the author explains that she sees Sekhmet as a warrior goddess, but stresses that Sekhmet can be so much more, and that's good. Let me read real quick. I've grown in my practice and devotion to Sekhmet since 2011, though, and my approach to certain of her gifts is, I hope, more nuanced than it was then. Please take that into account. She came to me so strongly as a warrior goddess that for many years it was very difficult for me to see her or approach her in any other way. That she revealed herself to me in this fashion does not mean that she cannot choose to come differently to other people. Very fair and insightful of her to, to say this, and uh, I've, uh, I give kudos to the author for saying that. Now, on page 16, she talks about her personal story. This is in the chapter on Sekhmet. And she mentions losing her profession, her apartment, her friends, all credited as being uh, harsh lessons from the goddess Sekhmet. Honestly, I'd like to know more about that. Uh, this is a personal story, and you might think that it's not relevant to other people, but sometimes it really can be. Somebody else out there might uh, read the, your story and, and really appreciate it. Now, the author does have a blog. Maybe she talks more about these sorts of things there. It's, it's listed in here. But you could do some cross-promotion on that and share some things that other people might benefit from, from knowing. Now, this book contains a nine-day devotional practice, a couple of recipes for oils, uh, and a divination system. All of them are very straightforward and fairly general, you could probably use them regardless of your particular practice. My only quibble is that, as a comedic, you would not want to use blood in an oil recipe. That kind of... it, it violates our purity standards. And on page 62, there's a Sekhmet blessing oil that uh, calls for uh, a few drops of your own blood. Now, she is kind enough to give an alternative ingredient that you can use. So if you're a comedic and you don't want to use actual blood and offer it to Sekhmet, which is kind of a dangerous idea, just use her uh, replacement ingredient and rock on. So if you're interested in working with Sekhmet, this book could definitely be a useful resource for you. Now, this author really talks up another author uh, and another book, Awakening Osiris by Norman D. Ellis. And uh, the subheading here is The Egyptian Book of the Dead. We'll get to this one in a minute. Our next book is Heart of the Sun, an anthology in exaltation of Sekhmet by Candace C. Kant and Anne Key. This is an anthology. It's a collection edited by two former priestesses of Sekhmet from the temple in Nevada. So, in terms of their focus, this is an anthology of goddess spirituality that centers on Sekhmet. Now, that doesn't mean it won't be useful for comedics, uh, parts of it anyway. Um, there are multiple contributors to this volume, and so I have multiple responses, and I was reading it very carefully. I still have uh, several post-it notes marking particular pages, some things I want to talk about. Let me start with the things that I liked. 
The quarter calls on pages 78 and 79 and the solitary ritual on page 98 would be great to use, especially if you happen to work with an open circle, an eclectic coven, and so, uh, or if you are more, you know, Wiccan or, uh, you know, general pagan in your orientation, these would be really useful. And even though I'm comedic, I like knowing about things like this so that if I'm, you know, working with other pagans, I have something that, you know, other people uh, can relate to. This would be a great resource. The chapter starting on page 21, Sekhmet, the Powerful One by Lorraine Tartoski, uh, is actually uh, well researched. It's pretty much straight on. And uh, I like the chapters with personal stories. For example, and by the way, they didn't number the chapters, so I'm giving you the page number it starts on. On page 61, in the temple with Sekhmet. Uh, that's a, a personal account from one of the priestesses, and uh, that's very enjoyable to read. Page 104, My Encounters with Sekhmet. That's actually written by uh, a gentleman, uh, Hank Wesselman, and his story actually squares up with uh, experiences that my husband Darren has had with Sekhmet. I just have one quibble with his chapter, though. Because in it, Mr. Wesselman describes going to Luxor and seeing a specific statue of Sekhmet, and here it is, our very own Melus GF Deadly Supia visited Luxor recently and shared this wonderful image with us. Well, the author in here visited that same statue, and he says it's the only one that is still alive. That I beg to differ with. Yes, statues of Sekhmet that are in museums, that's in a, a sterile and busy setting. It's kind of hard sometimes to get, you know, one-on-one -on -one time uh, in, in front of the goddess. But you can do it. And if you're aware, uh, she's very much there. Even if it's a broken statue, she can still come through them just fine. And what I've noticed is that if you really want to get a good picture of a lot of the Sekhmet statues that are on display in museums, you have to kneel in front of her. And if you're kneeling in front of the goddess, you know who you're in front of. So the other statues are very much alive if you're willing to pay attention. I have one other quibble with the chapter that starts on page 55, the Temple of Goddess Spirituality dedicated to Sekhmet, and it's by our editors. And it's a very descriptive chapter, and I, I like reading it overall, but uh, they describe Creech Air Force Base, which is right across from the area where the temple is, and how you have F-15s flying over, and she says that they, they even use the temple to kind of line up for the runway. And uh, they, they describe these things in kind of a negative light, like, you know, this is somehow counter to uh, a goddess of peace and a temple devoted to a goddess of peace. Well, Sekhmet is a goddess of war, too. So, have you considered that maybe it's kind of appropriate that the Air Force Base is actually there? And furthermore, uh, those F-15s, some of them have lady pilots. And when I was younger, had I not been too short with a bad back, I might have tried to be an Eagle driver. Um, but that was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But do you really think that Sekhmet wouldn't protect those Lady Eagle drivers and all the other folks that are working at that base? She wouldn't, you know, uh, extend some of her uh, attention to them? I think she would. But this illustrates the difference in philosophy that you have oftentimes with uh, goddess spirituality that still kind of has that flower child vibe and modern polytheism, which tends to be a little more balanced. Or at least what we see as being balanced. You know, they, they might consider us to be cynical, but, you know, hey, I'm, I'm just, you know, seeing actually the idea that you have this tension of opposites, which they do describe in here. You know, you have the, the temple that's devoted to peace, and then you have the air base devoted to war nearby. That's, that's a tension of opposites, and that's actually very, very comedic, you know, in, in outlook. Otherwise, in this book, the personal hymns are okay, and there's a guided meditation. I'm personally not much on guided meditations, but some people 
are. And if you are, then uh, you've got some in here. I will never criticize someone else's expression of faith. That is theirs, and uh, it's not my place to do that. I will, however, call out inaccurate information that people cite in order to sound knowledgeable. That is one of my purposes in life. So, let me talk about some of the things that I don't like in here. There is a chapter, starting on page 69, Sekhmet, Guardian of the Paths Between the Worlds, which is by none other than Genevieve Vaughan, the founder of the Sekhmet Temple. And on page 70 and 71, she cites a Senegalese professor, Sheikh Antadia. His writing was foundational to the modern Afrocentrist movement, but it's also been very heavily criticized by other scholars of color, by the way. Uh, and one of them actually wrote a very good book that I will be reviewing next year. But uh, some of his controversial uh, conclusions, which have been cited by others and get cited in here, include uh, etymologies, uh, tr uh, trying to connect words in the ancient Egyptian language with words from West African languages. And in here, see, some of these etymologies don't just skate on thin ice, they skate on frost. Here you have a West African Ghanaian dialect word for menstruation, and they're trying to connect it with Sekhmet. Huh? Now look, I will be very quick to say, archaeology in the Sudan and the rest of Africa is overlooked and underfunded, grossly overlooked and underfunded. We need more of it. Because there are people who try to make a connection between Egypt and West Africa. But I posit that in order to do that, you're going to need a lot more than just twisting words around. We need evidence of trade and communication. There are ways we could do that, and I'll talk about that in other videos. But in the meantime, put the ice skates away. Don't go skating on frost. Leave the bad etymologies at home. And there's a handful of them in here and they, they just don't wash. There's also some borrowing from Indian spirituality in here. In some of the chapters, they talk about kundalini energy and chakras. Again, if you're okay with that, that's cool, but understand that that comes from Indian philosophy. Uh, it's kind of become mainstream in the West now, but uh, uh, it is not original to Egypt, and if you're trying to be aware of where your spiritual practices come from, you need to keep that in mind. And then there's Normandy Ellis. She wrote a preface to this book. And on page X, that's uh, Roman numeral 10, she says, it has been suggested that certain of her statues, being Sekhmet's, aligned across the borders of ancient Egypt, were dusted with anthrax spores. When invaders passed through them, the anthrax invaded any open wounds they may have had, causing their deaths. What the f Look, human beings did not know about the existence of spores and bacteria until the 1600s. Okay, look up the development of the microscope. In ancient Egypt, they would have thought that diseases like anthrax, which they may not even have been able to identify as what we call anthrax, but they would have thought that these things were caused by bad air or bad water. And actually, in Africa, one of the sources of anthrax is, you know, infected watering holes. Um, watch nature documentaries. But to suggest that they were using biological warfare on statues of Sekhmet at the borders of Egypt, frankly, that's preposterous. And this is the author that Galena Kraskova loves so much? What? 
And by the way, other authors in Heart of the Sun just love and talk about Awakening Osiris, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which they say is a translation. Hold the phone. As it so happens, I was gifted this copy by our very own Morgan, our uh, lovely assistant. And he wrote a nice little message in here. Uh, <laughs> I'll read part of it, you know. May all the pantheons continue to smile upon you. Love, Morgan. But, you see, there's, there's actually kind of a history with this book, too. If you go on a website called Nietzsche's Coffee House in their Sutra library, they actually have what they say is the Book of the Dead. And I can remember way back in 2004 or so finding this and thinking it was actually from the Book of the Dead. And it sounds very nice. I'll read you a quick excerpt from in here. This is from page 164, Becoming the Child. In the womb before the world began, I was a child among other gods and children who were, or may be, or might have been. There in the dark, when we could not see each other's faces, we agreed with one mind to be born, to separate, to forget the pact we made that we might learn the secrets of our fraternity. We agreed to know sorrow in exchange for joy, to know death in exchange for life. We were dark seeds of possibility whispering. Then one by one we entered alone. We walked on our legs, and as we had said, we passed in well-lit streets without recognizing each other. Yet we were gods, sheathed in flesh, the multitude of a single spirit. It sounds nice. And yeah, I can remember reading it uh, and feeling warm and fuzzy way back then. But then when I got an actual translation by an Egyptologist of the Book of the Dead, it was wildly different from this. Because this is not a translation! This is a reinterpretation. There's a difference. So if you have this book, or this one, know that it will not replace a good reading list of Egyptology sources. And some of our good folks on Discord are actually working on that even now. So stay tuned. What Heart of the Sun does offer are some sincere hymns and poems and some rituals that you might be able to use either for yourself or with others. So it is going in my main library with caveats next to similar books like Circle of Isis and you know, Sacred Magic of Egypt, uh, books that do have some useful points to them but uh, you know take them with a grain of salt. Awakening Osiris is getting pride of place in the Library of Shame. I rise from a buried egg. Really? Give me my mouth, I want to talk. I'd call the police. Give me iron words forged in fire that I may speak the language of the earth. What? Uh, okay. I have come because I wish to have come. Good for you, man! I am a child of the earth and sky who rose from a buried egg, who followed the heart like following in the sun into the season of fire. You're kidding me, right? Wow! In the meantime, happy Thanksgiving to everyone who celebrates that, and a happy feast of Sed and the coronation of the Sacred Falcon to my fellow Kemetics, and happy dances! for all of our super thanks. Thank you, thank you. Also, come and join us on Patreon. You'll get to see things before everyone else. You'll get to see outtakes and exclusive videos. Uh, I did some footage from the eclipse that we had last month, and I'm working on a very special episode for Christmas, so stay tuned for next month. In the meantime, this is Sharon wishing you Send it to you. Enjoyed this video? Then be sure to hit like and subscribe to the Comedic Independent channel. You can also buy my books on lulu.com and special thanks to all my Patreon supporters. Join us for updates, outtakes, and exclusive videos only on Patreon. Check the description for links.